Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We will be talking about how Forcepoint enhances your Microsoft Azure security posture. I'm Ankur Chara, Principal Solutions Manager here at Forcepoint, and with me today is uh, Mattia Maggioli, Senior Manager, Strategic uh, Tech Partner Integrations. Hello, everyone. All right, let's jump right in. So, in today's environment, we see that we have some challenges and that is to secure access to resources anywhere, especially in uh, the post uh, pandemic era that everybody is trying to access the data, you know, in cloud on premises, you know, via the web. And so people are uh, accessing data from different places. And also they are trying to be productive and they're trying to uh, make sure that you're still trying to uh, avoid having any of the data loss typical problems that you were having in the past or uh, critical because of the way the data is being accessed. So with that said, you're still trying to prevent threats and data loss, but while you're having this, you know, an exciting way of a new way of working, which can be exciting, as I said. Uh, so with that said, let's see where you are in your digital transformation journey as an organization. So uh, when you look at security risk, uh, they change and compound with your digital transformation. So if you look at the risk as you're going on the uh, left side here and you're going from your traditional environment, which is on premises, you have different tools which might be fragmented or uh, siloed. And then you move into things like you have uh, SIM and log centric approaches where you're uh, trying to understand all the things, but you still do not have the full context. From there, you go into your remote user environment where you have uh, distributed locations, you have partners exchanging data, and uh, that might be at times bypassing your existing security controls. From that, you expand into your uh, security architectures, which might be uh, too rigid, inefficient to go beyond that. And in the end, you're looking at increasing your uh, you know, data and privacy uh, regulation, needing the ability to identify risky users. So as you can see from the left bottom all the way to the right top, you're going from an on-premises environment to a cloud first concept. And also not just that, you're going from a, a less contextual understanding of your, uh, you know, the data that you're collecting into more uh, understanding user-based understanding, human-centric understanding, and also uh, keeping on top of the privacy regulations that you might have uh, in the process. So this is how the digital transformation journey that we typically see. Uh, the reason we are uh, looking at this is everybody is somewhere in this journey and you might realize that, oh, you're maybe all the way uh, to the top or you're uh, you know, still in the process of reaching there. So with that said, let's go look at some of the technological aspects that we are seeing in today's environment. And that is cloud, you know, uh, cloud is uh, transformational when you look at the two main trends that we are seeing in the uh, environment and in the market. And that is SASE architecture, which focuses, focuses on what? Basically converge security as a service. And you also see zero trust approach. I'm not going to go into the whole concept of SASE and Zero Trust because that by itself might be, uh, you know, uh, half an hour to an hour of uh, discussion. And today, just because I want to focus on, uh, you know, how we are doing integrations uh, and how, what do they mean in today's environment, uh, that I'm going to focus on uh, just, you know, introducing the concepts here uh, of SASE and Zero Trust. And when they intersect, that's where the zero trust network access uh, comes into play. Uh, but here is an interesting uh, uh, statistics. 56% of business leaders have accelerated their zero trust journey through the pandemic. And that is uh, that was shared in the MISA summit uh, this year. So what that shows is these technological advancements are pushing the uh, you know, direction in which we are going. And also they're helping us address some of the main concerns that we are seeing in today's environment. And that is, you know, cloud, remote workers, and how you're accessing data. And people want to get access to the data wherever they are, uh, because otherwise they won't be uh, productive. And so that's the bottom line that we have to address. So 
let's uh, move on to the next slide and see how traditionally things were done. Uh, zero trust, uh, there is an understanding of you have to do uh, continuous verification. And why is that important? If you look at uh, the left side of the screen here, we are looking at implicit trust, which means anyone inside accessing anything, inside is good, outside is bad. And data can be you know, used inside, copied, moved, without much of controls. Um, overall, things are static inside. There's manual control. You put policies in place and they are you know, uh, static. They don't react, they're not changing. Uh, if you're trying to access inside, from a remote environment, you would typically come in, let's say via VPN or something like that. So that was the traditional way of working or accessing data. Now, in a zero trust environment, that changes. What it does is with the continuous uh, you know, verification in mind, you are accessing only what is explicitly permitted. So let's say if I'm trying to access a document, I would be only allowed to access that document uh, if I'm, uh, you know, the right person to be accessing that document at that time. And the usage is controlled and even revoked. So let's say if I am done with accessing that document for that duration, um, maybe in future I do not need that access. So my access is, uh, you know, revoked for that particular uh, data set. Also, you're doing a continuous monitoring and adaptive control, meaning you're monitoring how uh, uh, you know, how the trust is with me as a user. So what might happen at times is uh, if I am showing that I am allowed to access this data, it does not mean that once I have started accessing the data, you never check again. So that, that's what we were talking about, continuous verification. You keep on verifying that, hey, do I still have access to this document? Do, do my credentials still allow me to do it? Does my risk still allow me to do it. So that is where the environment is changing. And if you want to take a step back, uh, if you look at the left side, this is where the, you know, uh, the castle and the moat model comes into the picture, like where you have the corporate headquarters or, you know, the data is uh, safe inside and then everything outside is, you know, bad, inside is good. Anybody who is inside is trusted and they have free access and free reign to all the data uh, that they can. While on the right side, it's like, hey, it's a distributed environment. You do not know who's accessing at what, uh, uh, you know, from what uh, way. They might be coming in from different devices. They might be coming from different locations. Uh, so you have to change the way you're uh, thinking about allowing people to access data. So uh, the bottom line here is know and control who is accessing the resources using the data that you're collecting continuously so that you're not making the decision at the front end and that's it, you're not doing anything with it. So that's the concept of zero trust of continuous verification. So let's look at uh, a little bit more uh, regarding the zero trust aspect that uh, we are talking about. Uh, if you look at this uh, image, it shows that data protection, uh, you know, data by itself is at the center of zero trust architecture and protecting the data is uh, key. And uh, at force point here, what we are doing is we are taking that understanding and making sure that our data protection is dynamic. This is why we have the dynamic data protection, which fits in the zero trust architecture. What it allows us to do is, it allows us to have individualized adaptive data policies. What I mean by that is you have a policy which is in place, but that policy automatically adjusts. So what I'm saying is today, uh, I might be coming from uh, a low risk, uh, uh, you know, as a user, and I'm allowed to have access to the data. Tomorrow, if my risk score goes up, I might not have access to the same data. And nothing has changed from a policy um, which is put in place. Meaning, in the past, you would see that if a policy is in place, it's static and it's global. Uh, you know, am I allowed to access something via the cloud? The answer might be, let's say, no. 
And if the answer is no, that means I'm never allowed to access that data today, tomorrow, or any other time. Or it might be like, am I allowed to print a document? And the answer is yes. So the answer is yes, all the time. I'm allowed to print that document today, tomorrow, doesn't matter if my risk level changes. So when, with individualized adaptive policies, what you're doing is you are addressing that concern of how risky is that individual user? And based on the risk level, you can then have what policy gets applied to the, uh, to the user. And that is very important because uh, otherwise what you're doing is many times the data protection policies which are put in place are very restrictive and they do not allow people to be productive. And that's why it, they get a bad rap and many people just get stuck in an audit only mode. They're like, I do not want to block anything. And the reason I do not want to block anything is I don't know if I'm blocking more often than not legitimate users and they won't, won't be able to do their job. And I do not want to you know, handle that as a problem. So uh, that's why it's very important that you have the uh, understanding of risk. And to have a better context, you use behavior analytics to drive your insights of whether I'm risky or not, because my behavior uh, from a day-to-day -day basis might get changed and that might mean something else. Let's say tomorrow, if my credentials are compromised, it might look like it's me who's accessing the data, but it's not me. But what happens is my behavior has changed and uh, that might mean that the risk has gone up. And as soon as risk goes up, suddenly you're not allowed to access certain data and you have actually stopped data exfiltration in that uh, case. And let's say most of the times, if my risk level is low, most of your employees' risk level would be uh, you know, in the low risk category. And that is very important because uh, that will allow more users to be productive uh, most of the time. And that makes the security frictionless and that is very important. We also have data discovery and classification uh, where we also do uh, Microsoft Azure Information Protection uh, tie-in uh, for classification as well so that you can understand how critical the data is, how sensitive the data is, and how it needs to be uh, handled. Also, maximize uh, security analyst efficiency by reducing fatigue because we are going from an incident-driven um, uh, view lens to a more of a risky user and user centric lens uh, so that you're looking at indicator of behaviors uh, that if certain behavior is risky then you focus on that and uh, that also helps your uh, security analyst so uh, with that said uh, i want to talk about how force point approaches uh, the entire security landscape and that is you know human centric approach what we are doing is we are looking at your uh, entity behavior analysis, uh, then you, know, you try to get as much context as possible. And why is that important? Because if you do not know uh, what's happening uh, you know, in another aspect of the environment. So for example, if I'm doing something which is uh, low risk uh, in one system, but I have done something else in another system which has made me risky, uh, if you do not reconcile that, you would be missing out on the context. So it's important. So you have to do the entity behavior anal uh, analysis uh, with a 360 degree view. Once that happens, you can have a risk quantification, which is done in real time to see how risky I am as a user. And based on that, you can have real time countermeasures, which is risk adaptive protection, that the protection changes based on how much risk it poses to the organization. So this is continuous assessment of uh, compromised user risk and you go through this cycle. That is the human centric approach which uh, Forcepoint uh, focuses on. And that is why it makes it very uh, you know, interesting that you have to understand what is, uh, uh, like what is the user trying to do. Uh, if the access is uh, legitimate, if the uh, request which the user is asking for a certain uh, data, is actually um, you know uh, something which that user is supposed to do because many times uh, i've seen people who are a little uh, frustrated that hey in our policy we are not allowed to upload a document to a cloud destination and that is a blanket policy for the organization and what that does is if i'm a user 
uh, and I'm an employee who's just doing a day job and I want to upload a, you know, a customer presentation or a customer quote or something uh, to their portal, I'm not allowed to do that because that's the blanket policy uh, for the organization. If you have risk as a part of the discussion, well, now what you can do is based on that, if it is determined that I'm a low risk at that time, allow me to upload that document. I would be happy because I was like, hey, guess what? I'm able to do my job. Because if I'm not, then I'll be one, frustrated, or I'll try to look for alternatives or workarounds, which is never a good idea uh, from a security posture standpoint. So with that said, uh, let's jump right into what are we talking about when it comes to Forcepoint and Microsoft uh, partnership. So we as Forcepoint are a member of the Microsoft Intelligent Security Association MISA. Uh, so that is where, you know, you have to go through certain thresholds to be a part of that, uh, you know, certified uh, list of uh, vendors. So Microsoft, uh, Microsoft has, uh, you know, given us that uh, certification for the MISA. In addition to that, we are also a member of the Microsoft Active uh, Protections Program, the MAP program, uh, where uh, we get early access to vulnerability information so that we can incorporate that into our solutions. And that, what that does is that makes the security solution even more effective and up to date. So those are the things which uh, show the you know, working together of uh, Forcepoint and Microsoft. Uh, with that, what we are going to do right now is jump into the next portion uh, and I'll hand it over to Mattia. Thank you, Akur. So in the, during the past 12 months alone, Forcepoint developed 10 different integrations with uh, Forcepoint products and three different uh, Microsoft services on Azure. And these three uh, types of integrations deliver the benefits that Ankur has just been uh, telling you about. So all the five integrations with Azure Sentinel provide the users of those five first point products with the ability to export the intelligence and the events and all the activity logs that uh, were produced by the products and again more specifically all the intelligence that is necessary to correlate data downstream, those are, extreme, are exported automatically through our integration components into Azure Sentinel. Now, the benefit of this is again that 360 degree view, which is not within the organization provided by the first point products, but is exported with all the other data feeds that feed into Azure Sentinel. So any other solution, product or technology and especially all the workloads that are already running on Azure that are ready by default within Azure report their events into Sentinel, that level of visibility can be enhanced with the visibility of all the activities carried out by the first point products across all the layers of the technology stack of the organizations. Now, these five integrations and the other five integrations listed here do not do only two things. One is to increase the complexity of the setup because our integration middleware are extremely lightweight and that they are all provided free of charge. So you can deploy them and use uh, the integration guide, which is a very simple step-by-step -step document to get the integration deployed without any expert advice or any you know extra uh, personal needed to get the integration deployed. So it's extremely self-service, free and lightweight. And the other thing that they not do is to increase the complexity requiring any manual effort. Once the integration is deployed, it's developed and meant to run no stop 24 by seven without user integration, without user interaction. So it simply carries on with the activities of the component in real time without future, future intervention. Um, the other integrations that are listed in the lower part of the slide, the four integrations with Azure Active Directory, they deliver three different capabilities. For Cloud Access Security Broker and for Point BL Analytics, the two products that uh, provide a risk score together with the DDP as Ankur shown before. Well, the risk score of these two products for each user that is being identified by the products. So the risk score is exported into Azure Active Directory and used to tweak the authentication policies of Azure Active Directory. So this is a corner store capability of the product because Azure authentication is based on a number of variables and uh, 
uh, factors. One extra factor that we provide is the risk score calculated by the first point products across all the data feeds and across all the layers of the technology stack of the organization that would not be visible to Azure without this level of integration. Everything that happens on premise or anywhere else, any location, any uh, portion of the infrastructure which is not Azure might not and typically is not visible uh, to Azure Active Directory. So with this level of visibility and the integration with Azure Active Directory, the authentication policies opposed by Azure to the Azure users are tweaked and again in real time and automatically depending on the risk score and the mapping of the risk score into policies that is uh, possible thanks to this integration. Another capability is uh, through the secure hybrid access uh, provided by Azure Active Directory, which is exposing the web application hosted on premises, typically the web interface, the, you know, the management interface of our products for DLP, FBA, and the next generation firewall, and expose the web uh, management console not directly to the internet because that would be the very opposite of a secure access, but they are made available outside of the company infra without VPN through an extra layer of security, which is the authentication layer of Azure Active Directory. So before reaching the web application, before getting you know, the access to the uh, web uh, management of the product, there is a layer of authentication, again, with the Azure Active Directory uh, security policies, which once it's successfully passed, uh, will give access to selected users mapping uh, uh, Azure AD groups uh, into roles within the product console automatically online without VPN, without all the manual effort of configuring or having to um, dial in with a VPN connection. And again, over the same level of uh, secure traffic, which is typically of the uh, secure HTTP protocol. The last type of integration, which is uh, for the next generation firewall, um, is about SD1. So any organization which is big enough to require specific and priority traffic over an SD1 layer would typically ask an internet service provider or another player within the SD1 market for and paying for the SD1 service. Now, there are two limitations. One is that the cost is higher because there's an extra overhead from the SD1 cost. And the other problem is that uh, uh, configuring routing, uh, especially routing with the subnets and the virtual subnets that are within Azure is not straightforward and is not out of the box. So it's more expensive and more complicated. Now, again, we don't want to make this complicated, especially for uh, an organization that has already a footprint of next generation firewall securing the different branches and headquarters. So what this integration does, and it's simply done by a small tool that we make available, uh, the component connects to the control center, the security management center that controls the entire fleet of next generation firewalls, connects to Azure and deploys all the components within Azure Virtual One that create the SD1 layer by generating redundant IPsec tunnels between each location where a next generation firewall is and one or more Azure hubs within different Azure regions. The level of control here is total lef totally left to the user. So the user can define the security protocols and ciphers of the IPsec tunnels, the Azure regions, uh, that are uh, um, the other endpoint uh, of an IPsec tunnel and the uh, routing between uh, local connections, existing VPN tunnels or the SD1 layer is left to the user. So once the virtual one uh, layer of SD1 is created, the routing choices are left to the user. There is no interference with the existing traffic. Now, I have spoken lengthily probably around the benefits, but there are four key benefits developed by adopting these integrations. First of all is the increase of productivity and enabling future productivity with safer collaboration at the same time. One of the typical um, problems of multiple applications across multiple layers of the technology stack is the require you know using different uh, accounts and credentials to handle all the complexity of a modern IT infrastructure but this is gone 
using a single identity source, which is the Azure Active Directory, and being able to integrate the users, groups, and permissions and authentication policies in this case, coming from the single identity source, which is Azure Active Directory. The other benefit is about providing access while improving security with risk adaptive policies. And again, using the risk score for aligning the security, the authentication policies along with the risk score calculated by our products, providing access without further uh, components or technologies needed while increasing the security of all this at the same time. Again, visibility 360 degrees across uh, everything IT that a company has by feeding all these uh, uh, data and uh, event logs uh, into Sentinel, for example. And then again, enhance the security either at the network layer with an SD1 uh, solution or across products uh, within the current infrastructure at no future cost because the integrations are provided free of charge. Now, I had the 10 integrations in the initial slide, but I guess you don't want to see 10 of the same. I'll just show one of those, one of the most uh, uh, interesting one uh, from my point of view. And this is about uh, force point behavioral analytics and the integration of the risk score and how the risk score uh, impacts uh, the dynamic policies of our products. So for users that are familiar with Azure, uh, within Azure, uh, an administrator can configure different apps that are, that are made available to all the users based on the permissions and the rules that are defined. So in my case, I am the IT admin of the force point products within uh, this uh, uh, demo organization and I have the three force point products that are available within the secure hybrid access. So for the force point behavioral analytics, simply by clicking here, I would end up in this page, which is the web front end of force point behavioral analytics. As you can see, there's no request of user credentials because through the single sign on, this will route the authentication request to Active Directory. The Azure Active Directory will do the validation of the credentials, of the permissions, everything according to the security policies defined within the Active Directory configuration. And this will allow me to access the um, analytics console of Forcepoint Behavioral Analytics. Now, the product does one of those key uh, capabilities that uh, Ankur mentioned before, which is the correlation of different data feeds uh, in order to calculate a risk score for every user. And uh, beside the list of events, uh, this is the very simple display of the result of the first point behavior analytics uh, uh, users within my directory. And uh, Christy Graf, happens to be the highest, the, re, the user with the highest risk. And the FBA also shows what happened. She wasn't that risky until uh, a couple of days before you know, the time here of the data. But the beauty of the product is that uh, it gives you a complete timeline of all the events, which is instrumental to show why these integrations matter to an organization. First of all, we know that uh, uh, Christy is the CFO of a company based in the US. And the timeline, so the time ordered sequence of all the events made available to Forcepoint Behavioral Analytics to understand uh, the risk of this, the risk score of this user shows that, uh, well, something happened from an external IP, there was a change of the email address associated with the user. And you can tell by the email address that this is not good because this is not Christy asking for that change. And the change is instrumental to avoid the user to be notified of what happened next. What happened next was that from some very unusual locations for a CFO of a company that has never left the US, there were successful single sign-on. Now, this is the kind of activities that happens when there is no single identity source, because these events would have been prevented, blocked in the first place with the integration in place between FBA and Azure Active Directory. What happened next is that the actual user tried to authenticate, but the access was denied because the 
attacker had already changed the credentials, the password associated with the account. So the hackers are in and the legitimate user is out and cannot do anything, cannot block, cannot you know, prevent future activities that happen. You know, those activities from different locations probably you know, backed by a VPN or some kind of technology to avoid the detection. Uh, they go into the Salesforce uh, application of the company. So they get access to the sensitive data or customer data of the user. And then again, this is just an example of all the events that because of the uh, mathematical models configured within FBA contributed to the enhance of risk score. Now, this is one, the ability to see things and decide the risk associated with every single user that is in the directory, in the source of identity. But then, for example, well, a tangible example of how the uh, risk information becomes a trigger for improve, well, automated policies that adapt with the risk. If I switch now to our DLP solution, I just configure a single, a simple policy to show why I don't have to do many different policies or change things uh, manually uh, for the simple reason that our DLP solution can leverage the risk score calculated by FBA as a parameter within the policies. So out of the many policies that a user can configure in the data, um, side of the uh, product. If I went into DLP policies and I decided to manage some custom policy, here is one risk adaptive policies that I created. Now this policy is, is very simple. It's one of those blanket policies that on a standard product are fairly dumb because they're blanket policies. But in this case, the ability to detect attachments, uh, even a single attachment, uh, uh, in an email that goes outside of the company uh, email server as a risk adaptive behavior, even if it's a blanket policy. So any user that uploads, that sends an email with at least one attachment, well, the behavior of DLP, either blocking or not, will depend on the risk level of that user at that specific moment. So a typical configuration here would be for low risk users, we are auditing. So we still have visibility on the events, but nothing else happens. The action is allowed right away. For risk level three, which is, you know, halfway between low and high, well, we should notify someone because someone probably has to have a look at this. But again, the activity is still allowed. And then typically you would take some uh, forceful actions, either dropping all the email attachments so that nothing sensitive or nothing unintended leaves the company uh, mail server. And the worst case scenario, like in Christie case, block everything. So no email uh, going outbound because it's matching a DLP policies. Now, this is just an example, but once I set proper policies that are tailored on the needs of my organization, I just need to leverage the risk user to make the policies behave differently in different scenarios. The so, typical... Mattia, I had a, yeah. like, this is very interesting. So this is what we were talking about, that majority of your uh, scenarios would be where employees are in the risk level one, two, or maximum one, two, and three, so that they are still able to do their job and they're able to send that attachment, as you mentioned in this example. Uh, but as soon as uh, it was in this case of uh, Christy, where uh, her risk level uh, was, uh, you know, uh, high at uh, level five, now it actually also helps protect the organization by dropping the blocking everything you know dropping email attachment at risk level 4 and then blocking everything at risk level 5 without any other human intervention because this is automated and that's what makes it easy so that if a uh, majority of your employees are in risk level 1 or 2 they would not even have any uh, problems doing their day-to-day -day job. But also on the flip side, when the CFO's account gets hacked and, and somebody is trying to exfiltrate data via email, because email is the most common channel of exfiltration nowadays, um, it ends up blocking it and saving the organization from a uh, you know data leak. So uh, exactly. this is a very good example. And another thing is, if we go back to the demo scenario that we had before, if these integration 
was in place when the uh, events, you know, the attacks here uh, happened. Once the, even if the hacker was successful in uh, taking ownership of the account, then once he can access resources, he would try to access them. For example, the company CRM. But then if the user has an increased risk because the product has identified unusual events, at the time that the attacker tried to access the CRM, the increased risk together with the different change of permissions within the Active Directory would have prevented access to any application or other resource whose um, accounting of the users is done through the Active Directory. So the reason why this integration is powerful is because together with the zero trust approach, which relies on the point, you know, the timely identification of users and associated permissions, the risk increase would reduce the permissions of the user. And once the user has reduced permission, even an attacker cannot access any corporate resource because with the increased risk, it doesn't have access anymore to that resource. Cool, very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Well, I guess, uh, I can hand it over uh, to you, Ankur. Thanks. Interesting example and also showcasing how we integrate together with the um, Azure, uh, you know, ecosystem there. So one of the things which I would like to, uh, you know, conclude with is the force point difference. Uh, what we are doing here is dramatically reducing the exposure to data breaches through automated security controls. As you saw that there was no individual person who was going and changing the policy. The policies change automatically, which is what makes the security frictionless and easily adoptable by organizations. Also, industry leading security risk management for hybrid and cloud environments, because that's what we are seeing a trend towards, uh, that more and more uh, organizations are in a hybrid situation or cloud first uh, you know uh, strategy for their expansion also trusted strategic security partner at scale because uh, we have to not only look at the uh, you know uh, integrations but also make sure that it can scale in today's global environment where you might have uh, you know a lot of employees accessing a lot of different things from a lot of different places so you should uh, look at a security solution which can scale based on your requirements also we have 20 plus years of experience focused exclusively on uh, security solutions. So we are a security cybersecurity organization focusing on security solutions and have uh, over two decades of experience doing that. So that is the force point difference. Uh, with that said, I would like to leave you with uh, all the different uh, resources that we have. Uh, so you can definitely reach out to us if you want to, uh, or if you want to access anything as a follow up, uh, here is a list of uh, resources that you can access on, uh, you know, our uh, website as well as uh, other uh, locations that you might have access to. So with that said, I would like to thank Mattia for all the uh, great information that you shared and thank you all for joining us today for this session. Thank you, Akuru, and take care, everyone.